G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plugger Podcast. I'm coming at you live with the co-host Connor Rogers. Rog, how are you mate? You're never better mate. Another long range episode unfortunately. From Armstrong Creek to Watsonia. I wish we were sitting side by side with a belly full of curry and some donuts at the ready. But that's okay. We're nothing wrong with a bit of long range. Uh, speaking of dinner, how'd you go? How'd you go without me tonight? Yeah. Fend for yourself. Well, we always eat. We're yet to do a cook-in dinner. We're yet to uh, whip some up ourselves uh, before the potty. But tonight I did. Beetroot burger wrap with some uh, rosemary so- sea salt spuds. And it was absolutely delicious, mate. How'd you go? Uh, yeah, it went well. Georgia came around and we had some pad thai made oh. from home as well. So we've just both got on the home-cooked meal, which is unbelievable. Well, maybe maybe next week I'll bring ready, steady, cook style. I'll bring some ingredients up. I'll give you four or five ingredients and you can whip something up for us. Yeah, that could be unreal for the pod vlog. Now, Roggy, we'll get straight into the footy action. We'll kick things off. Are, are, are you sure this. you don't want to talk some more about what we ate for dinner or, or should, we, <laughs> should we talk about some footy or something? No, we'll leave that to our lifestyle podcast, okay. uh, Potatoes and Spuds, on, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over on a different website. But we'll kick off with the headline of the week. Do you want to run us through it? It's nice and simple, mate. No bells or whistles here. But our <laughs> headline, Dawson Rodge Limited, would read... Kanga, 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 aru, aru, aru. Bloody good to see him get their first W, McDonald. Yeah. Yeah, that no, was. It was unbelievable. Um, going into that week, you sort of felt like this was their one chance at it. This was, and I know they'll probably pinch an upset throughout the year and get to that two or three win mark. I think they will, but it, it just sort of felt like this is, this is their, their chance at it, and they took it. But it didn't look good early. Did you catch the scores early? They were down I, by about five goals. I did. This was a game that I was sort of drifting in and out of. It was uh, it was a Saturday game, wasn't it? So I think I missed the first half of it because I was playing. But uh, yeah, Getting no, I, the best just quietly. Yeah, I'm no longer a plugger. It's just devastating <laughs> times. I, I hope I regress next season. And I can find myself back in a back pocket. But. Um, yeah, the, the Kangas, I did say they were down early, but that makes that first win all the better. I, I'm more feeling uh, pure relief because I was sure that Carlton were going to be the first team to lose to them. Yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't look good for the Hawks at the moment, does it? No, but at the same time, it could potentially be half a blessing in disguise. Now, everyone's aware of exactly where they're at. You know, there's no, no one's under any illusions. This is full-blown rebuild. They are bottom of the barrel. And rightfully so, after you've won four premierships, you know, it's, it, it's, not, mm. it's not a bad thing for them to be bottoming out. I think that's just how football works. Um, but, yeah, now everyone's on the same page. But wrap for North Melbourne. And after, uh, after the win on the Sunday footy show... Uh, David Noble, it was my first time properly hearing him speak, and G, yeah. G spoke well. I was a big fan. It was my first time listening to him, and he couldn't have been any more impressive. I, I get the feel from my little five-minute interview <laughs> I saw of him, I get the feel he might be the right man for the job. He does look like the right man, to be honest. And even like throughout the week, he was copying a bit of flack for talking about the process over going for the victory. But if like I tuned into his press conference, and him sort of uh, explaining the thought behind that statement and saying, like the words he was using was great. He was saying, well, to get the win, you need the process, which enables the mechanism of a win. And I was like, this is just, this makes sense. Like, I I understand it. Well, it makes so much sense because there are some people who go, stop telling us about the process, just give us wins. But it's possible to win ugly, you know, flood the back, um, and then hit him on the counter and maybe, you know, potentially win by a goal in a 50 to 44 win. But mm. would you rather that and they scrape to four or five wins this season winning ugly or would you rather they, they work on the process, they work on premiership winning footy, of course they won't be there for another few years hopefully, um, yep. but would you rather them work on what could potentially be premiership winning footy, only win one or two games but slowly get better at that brand and then when the time's right in a few years when they've all developed then they'll be experts at the process and winning flags. I think that's the right way of going about it rather than just worrying about the W on the board. Yeah, for sure. And you hear a lot of people talk about how long it takes 18-year-olds to learn the habits and the behaviours to be really good, consistent footy players and really good, consistent footy teams. So I think to drum it into that core group of 18, 19, 20-year-olds at the moment, I think it just seems like the best way to go about it. And to get a win, to get that nourishment, as um, as they said, it's um, it was a bloody good result and it was great scenes. 
Absolutely. And there, there's players are starting, you're starting to see um, the future. You know, there are your Taron mm. Thomases and whatnot. Jai Simpkin, I know he's not uh, a really young kid anymore, but there has some players that are starting to show a lot. The Yak, Dave LDU, is starting, mm. to, starting to show plenty. So, yeah, there are bright signs. Uh, ben Mackay down back. Um, yeah, plenty happening for North. And they do have reasons to get excited despite their, their poor start. No, it was good. It was good to see, um, just to wrap up on, on the ruse, it was funny. Towards the end, Hawthorne kicked one with about two minutes to go and there was this young North Melbourne fella behind the fence of where Hawthorne were kicking. So they ran into an open goal and it sort of just lingered on the goal umpire as he was doing the signal for the snag. And I just saw this poor North kid, because they were up by about 18 points, 12 points. Hawks got it back within a goal with two minutes to go. And he just put his hand in his head, and he, he would have been about you know nine or ten. And I, I really felt for him after for that last minute and a half. I was just whipping them home for that kid that they got home, uh, which they did. So it's great for all the supporters and everyone involved. Absolutely, uh, we went to a couple. Well, I went to a couple of games of footy this weekend. I went to Richmond GWS on Saturday night. Absolutely classic contest. Although, absolute ring a ding dinger. Although I. Did not really see much of it at all. I was there uh, for a work work function and uh, I was more occupied at the bar than I was the footy, which is a shame because it turned out to be an all-time classic. But the other game we happened to watch <laughs> was the D's and the Baggers. Your mob, the my mob, my mob. Yes. Thoughts, opinions, feelings on the contest. Is that why you didn't come down, Rod? Is that why you didn't show your face? Yeah, correct. <laughs> oh, too, too much shame. I actually haven't left their house today. I've not <laughs> opened Facebook, Instagram. I'm actually lost to the world for the next month. Um, look, I, I really enjoyed it. That was one of my most enjoyable days at the football. I don't know. I just felt like the, the group that we went, Danny Colson and, and Maddie, um, that they were great value. And I don't know. I, I just really like, for some reason, like for years I've despised the Sunday time slot. But rocking up on a Sunday, like you've already had a good weekend, plus you get to go to the footy. It's yeah. the end of the weekend. You top it off with the game. Um, I could, yeah, I, where I could can't agree with you more there is because when it's on a Friday night or a Saturday, it's rip up prime time. But you are thinking, if I wasn't at the footy, I'd have something else on because it's a Friday or a Saturday. But yeah. Sunday feels like a bonus because it's your... It's, it's a bonus. It's yeah. your relax day. And on your relax day where you're meant to be doing nothing, you're meant to be washing the car and doing the dishes, you're watching, yeah. you're watching the footy at the G. It, is, it does yeah. feel like a bonus. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's how I felt. And um, I, I just had a great day. I, I'm going to be not... I'm going to be honest. The game sort of went how I thought it would go. Like, there was murmurings during the week that... Because every time we play the Blues over the last five or six years... We might be pushing for the eighth. Uh, we might be pushing for the top eight while the Blues are sort of coming out. This I'm talking 2017, 2016, and we drop those games. And then I, I don't know. I just feel like over the last few years, the D's and the Blues uh, contests have been really, really close. Well, last year I think we pipped you by a point when you came back from 40 points down. So they're always thereabouts. And after you, uh, the Blues' competitive effort last week against the Bulldogs, there was those murmurings of. You know, the days of old, who, who's going to rock up? Is it going to be the Melbourne side that, that drops a game to, a, to a, a team just outside the eight? But I, I had a lot of trust. I had a lot of faith. And the results sort of went the way I thought it would. Bit of an arm wrestle. Um, at times, I felt like the Blues were on top. I felt like they missed a few chances, but also took a few chances. But overall, I was pretty pleased with the control um, and the maturity that the Dees had throughout the day. How did you see it, Roger? Well, it's funny you mentioned how people considered, you know, Carlton a bit of a chance during the week. And it was all down to gambler's fallacy. I'm not sure if you're aware of the phenomenon. <laughs> but, when it's been, but when it's been red on the roulette wheel eight times in a row, people go, oh, it has to be black next. <laughs> But it's, it's wrong logic. Every spin, it's a 50-50. It doesn't matter what happened beforehand. And everyone yeah. seems to be thinking, well, well, the Ds have won eight in a row. They can't <laughs> win nine. Surely they're gettable yeah. at some point. But if you yeah. if you look at, if you take it, you know, for what it's really worth on face value, the Ds are such a polished, refined outfit. You, we were sitting directly behind the goals, you and I. And Amazing. In our crew, and I never sit. I usually avoid behind the goals, and I feel a bit silly for doing that because I always thought that was the worst point of view. You see the less 
the least amount of the ground. But yeah. when you sit behind the ground, you see the team defense and the grid shifting across. And watching Melbourne's organization, yeah. you know, we'd have it in the wing. We look up, you have that grid set up, um, and we couldn't penetrate, so we had to kick it across the ground. And you just see the whole Melbourne team shift across. You are that polished and that well defensively drilled. Um, that even you know increased my uh, my thoughts of your premiership possibilities. Um, and yeah, look from the, from a Carlton perspective, um, disappointing, very disappointing. But you know the people are already calling for Teague's head. There are Carlton some top comments on Carlton posts are saying you know mm. it's it's not happening and all of this sort of stuff. And it, while I understand the frustration, we should be in a better spot than this. And I know every team has injuries and whatnot. There are some excuses, but we should be better doing better than what we are. Um, but where I try and keep the faith is reminding myself that. Everyone wanted Nathan Buckley sacked and then he took yeah. him to a grand final. Everyone wanted Simon Goodwood sacked uh, and now he's on top of the on top of the ladder undefeated. Uh, everyone wanted Damian Hardwick sacked and now they're one of the greatest sides we've ever seen. So, you know, we've sacked Ratton, we sacked Malthouse, uh, we've sacked Bolton. Um, and I don't want to say it's just sack another coach, get another bloke, even if it wasn't Alistair Clarkson. Who knows, you know, what... What would happen? I would rather just stick with the coach, show show them the faith for a long period of time, um, give them time to gel, and you know keep the faith. But it is hard to keep the faith when we've been saying that for twenty years. Yeah, I felt bad for some of the Blues supporters at times because there was a lot of um, a lot of frustration, and I I could see the players like as you were saying when you were doing those switches, and as we were watching the Melbourne grid, almost all in line, just merge from one side of the ground to the other defensively it, it, it was sort of like a mature thing from the blues where they weren't just bombing it in they were doing little 15 meter kicks and then doing like another switch and i i could feel the frustration from carlton fans like oh just go inside 50 because potentially after a couple of switches they turn it over but it, what i saw was a team trying to not just do the old habits of kicking it long putting it on on Casbolt's head when he's not actually in a great position. They were trying to work it out and they just couldn't. So I think, um, you know, I'm pretty sure the Blues have a couple of injuries. They're, they're also a bit of an immature side. So I think if you do stick it out, it could be for the best. And I can see you guys pinching wins towards the back end of the season and setting yourself up for a big preseason and going again. And I know it's not what Blues supporters like to hear, but I, I don't think it's far off in a way. Yeah, well, the... The other, really, the other thing really shooting us in the foot at the moment is the the vibe and the morale and the energy because you know a team like North Melbourne they know where they're at a team like Hawthorne they know where they're at um, they understand the phase they're in so they can still go into each game motivated because it's they, they're not overly deflated at where they're at is where I this is how I interpret the psychology but when yep. you when you're Carlton and you know all the hype all the rate especially for the supporters that we were meant to be content. You know, meant to make the eight. We've got all these young kids that are now men and they're developed. And then you add players like Williams and uh, Saad and Fogarty and these blokes in. Surely we're contending for the eight. So now when we're so evidently not and we're, you know, back with the salad dwellers, uh, salad dwellers rather, um, it does make us, uh, it does suck all the energy out. And we're not going into each game optimistic. And it, there is sort of a vibe at the moment of who cares, you know, like another waste yeah. of the season. So, yeah. Yeah, it is a bit doom and gloom at the moment, but you just got to keep the faith and uh, and hope we come good. Um, I am doomy and gloomy about uh, a news story during the week, McDonald. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this has really upset me. Uh, could I please get your initial feelings on the now infamous Jordan Degoe bum grab incident? Um, it. So I think it's different to the Boston. Um, I, I thought the Vloston finger uh, <laughs> fin- finger insertion was yeah. uh, probably a little bit not on. Um, yeah. And I know it was quite playful and uh, Marby or Chow wasn't offended and it was all just having a bit of a laugh. Just a play- playful bum, finger up the bum. Uh, <laughs> wish they always are. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I, thought, I, I just felt like that probably, as much as I love the banter and whatnot, that probably wasn't a good look. Um, I know the Dugowie one, people could probably see is cut from the same cloth, but that was just a bit of a grab, a bit of a pinch, a bit of a slap on the bum, more than a finger 
insertion per se. So genuinely, um, I didn't really see that much of an issue with it. it what about yourself? It's absolutely baffled me. Like I, it's almost honestly like a Batuta Advocate satire article is what I feel like I'm watching. Because when <laughs> when I heard Jordan Ngoi controversy, the AFL are investigating. I, automatically my head goes to some, you know, really evil, dark places. But then when you see what actually happened, the bum tap, and it was a, it was a grab. I wonder, do you reckon there would be anywhere near as much um, noise about this if he didn't go the grab and it was just a few firm taps? Like what? At what yeah, no, I, I think the taps, yeah, the taps would have been fine, but it was the grab that... Yeah, it gained the most attention. It's so bizarre to me. Like, you know, as a reserves footballer, if you saw what happened in our rooms after a game, especially after win in the showers, it it would ma- make that look like a bloody walk in the park. That that bum grab. <laughs> I'm absolutely amazed at what's happened, and um, I'm also a bit, you know, upset that the media haven't uh, called it out and come out and said. This is absolutely outrageous. Like this is where they're just playing footy. Different story if the player came out and said, "I was, you know, I did not consent to that touch, and I feel, mm. you know, I don't like when players touch my bum." But this is what footy's all about. The camaraderie is giving your mates a bum tap and a bum grab in the huddle. That's that is the core of football. Mm, I'm pretty sure it was looked at by the AFL, and nothing's come of it. So it was sort of. I think they might get a bit of a be careful because the cameras and, and whatnot. But I think. It was sort of a bit of a non-issue. Yeah, yeah. It, it also irks me that this is in their rooms. Like it's almost, it feels like a hidden camera. It's not like a Fox footy. No, nah, it does, yeah. It, it feels like, you know, they're in their own bedroom and someone's called them out and I'm, you know, masturbating. It's like, you <laughs> let, let them do what they want to do in their own space, please. Um, mm. But one aspect of the media that did, uh, did rub me the right way, actually, uh, was the Willie Rioli story. So, yep. obviously, he uh, was caught with marijuana in an airport. Um, and I think he got, off, he got off without any charges or anything like that. It was just good at behaviour type operation, maybe some community service. And yep. I was worried that the media was going to come out and bash him and say, you know, he's already had a chance. Um, he's proven himself untrustworthy. But most of the media, your Mark Robinsons and your Jared Waitleys on 360, they've come out mm. su- supporting him, saying wrap their arms around him. It, it's really not that bad to be caught with marijuana. So many people smoke. It's, you know, it's not like he's up on the ice or anything like that. I'm glad yeah. that they put it in the right perspective and it's been treated as the minor misdemeanor that it is. No, I'm glad it was as well um, because I yeah, I don't want to lose a Willy Rioli. I don't want him lost from the game and I'm as excited as a lot of people to see him do his stuff again. He's, um, he's, he's a real uh, cog in the way the Eagles go about it and I think... You know they'd be super pumped to get him back, but I just think the game needs players like him. He's so exciting, uh, he's so skillful, and yeah, it, it just would have been a terrible way to go. So I really hope West Coast, you know, wrap their arms around him, get him back in the club, look after him because I'm pretty sure after the Asada stuff happened, he's like you get banished from the club. It's not even like he can come in but can't play games. I'm pretty sure he gets banished from like. The club, so it's very hard for them to take care of him at yeah. the moment. Um, he's obviously back in August, I'm pretty sure, from his Asada ban. But yeah, the sooner he gets back, the sooner they can hopefully, you know, really I look am after him. So excited to see him run back out there. He won't be playing this <clears> year, but next year, hopefully, he runs out there. Absolutely tears it to shreds, and uh, good to see him back, better than ever, and back in Premiership player uh, quality. Uh, throughout the season. That's what I can't wait for. For sure. Uh, Roger, so last week, <coughs> I thought we had a great uh, podcast episode. It was received pretty well. Well, if, very well. If we may say so ourselves. If yes. we may say so ourselves. But I uploaded a clip, um, a little bit clickbaity. I thought putting Prison Bar in the title might get me a couple of extra <laughs> Sunday Arvo views. So yep. I put up the clip of us talking about the Prison Bars and it brought along plenty of emotion and brought along plenty of pla- uh, plenty of passion in, in yeah. the comments which was great and I love some of um, some of the, re- the responses talking about you know the, the history of Port Adelaide and what it means to them and uh, to, to the, the history of Adelaide and, and, and stuff like that I, I do get around a bit 
there was a few people who didn't like <laughs> didn't like a couple of things that I said. Um, that you said? Yeah, well, I, I, I was talking about how... Because we... Is, it, we sort of is had, this you clearing the air, is it? This is me clearing the air. Okay. Yeah. Just trying to get your supporters back on side. Did you, did you lose a couple of subs, did we? No, I was just going through the messages and it was sort of... I wanted to reply to all of them because I felt like I was uh, misinterpreted. But I also just couldn't be bothered uh, commenting back to <laughs> all, all these comments. But um, some of the comments were saying... Because my point was, just to rehash, <laughs> <laughs> just to rehash the debate that I thought we ended... Uh, my comment was talking about how you're sort of in murky waters with the identity of the football club by wearing black and white because the black and white club of the AFL is Collingwood. And I know it's an alternate kit, so that sort of changes that, that little rule. <laughs> um, but I, I did mention, and this is what people jumped on me for, I did mention that, you know, the blue and white team are Geelong. And some of the comments were like, well, hang on, the blue and white team's North Melbourne. <laughs> yeah. And then someone wrote the blue and white team's Carlton. And I said, well, no, Carlton are the blue team. <laughs> Carlton are the navy blue team. Carlton are the blue team. But, um, yeah, uh, yeah, it was the blue and white that got me in trouble. And I thought it was obvious that the hoops are different to the kangaroo stripes. And I'm pretty sure that the blue and the white in those colours are different. I'm pretty sure the blue's yeah. different and, out of those yeah. two clubs. Yeah, and, but, f- and for them, it's the blue and white stripes and the blue and white hoops, a vast difference. But the Port Adelaide Magpies are black and white prison bar and the black and white stripes of Collingwood, I think they're a little bit more similar. I think that, that you've got more of an argument there to say that they have striking similarities. Well, that, yeah, that's what I felt. Um, and I, I, I feel like most people listening would have been picking up what I was putting down. But there was just a few that sort of grabbed me out of context and tried to pull me up on a point and, um, you know, each to their own. Oh, well, it, there you go. All, all, I, all um, love and war. At the footy club, uh, I had Connor Galvin, uh, forward flanker at the Banyol Beavers, come up to me and um, he's a port supporter and he was sure to give me an earful, tell me how absolutely wrong I was um, <laughs> in the prison bar debate. So it is something they're very passionate about. I think the top comment on the uh, podcast <laughs> last week was, Something along the lines of, here we go, two Victorians talking about what Port Adelaide fans want or whatever. And I thought, you know what, that's probably a fair call. I'll, 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 yeah. I'll pay that. But, uh, you know, we have to cop Kane Corns absolutely bar- barraging every Victorian club. So we're just here to return serve a bit. No, I love it. I love it. But it's a um, healthy debate and it's a bit silly that it's still going and it's all about the a Guernsey. Uh, but a debate that uh, is probably a bit more important, I think a little bit more worthy of discussion, is Brett Ratton uh, not happy with the holding the ball interpretation uh, with his St Kilda match against Geelong. And he even went as far to say something along the lines of he might consider instructing his players not to tackle because what's the point? You don't get rewarded for it. Jeez, I would have loved playing footy and uh, having the <laughs> instruction not to tackle because I wasn't doing a lot of that in the first place. Um, yeah, that, that was an interesting comment by uh, by Brett Ratton because it's sort of giving the players an out. It's sort of like ha- having a bit of a whinge at the umpires and and sort of saying, oh, you know, geez, we deserved a few a few more holding the balls. It's giving the players a bit of an out for the loss. I was driving up to the Melbourne and Carlton game and Ross Lyon was speaking on it. And I just thought, uh, what he said was unbelievable. Um, and, and he was saying, you know, it's funny that we, you know, Brett Ratton in particular is criticising umpiring for their poor, poor performance when in fact he could probably criticise the goal kicking of his own club for yeah. that sort of poor performance. So he was sort of criticising criticizing the umpires for having an off night when realistically you could criticise your own team for missing their own opportunity and sort of taking accountability for the loss rather than trying to, you know, say it's the umpire's fault per se, which I thought was um, really spot on. And I'm not hanging uh, Brett Ratton out to dry. I think he was probably just a little bit frustrated and um, he will pull the troops into line this week. But they had their own chances to win that game, St Kilda. I don't think it had anything to do with the holding the ball rule at all. I do have a little bit of a gripe with uh, the holding the ball rule. Not the rule itself, but the way that the fans 
think that the rule is written when a lot oh, of the, no. when a lot of the fans yeah. are wrong. It frustrates me so much when I go to the football and you're surrounded by people. A lot. Don't get me wrong. Most people probably do know what's happening, but the vocal might mi- mi- probably minority that don't actually understand the rules and. Don't, don't get me wrong, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan myself, obviously. So there are times where I'll just yell out, ball, or in the back, just because you're caught up with the heat of the moment. But there are so many supporters who really drive the point home. They go, how yeah, was that not, he did not dispose yeah. of it correctly. How yeah, was that not on the ball? Yeah. This is a disgrace. And I'm there going, you don't understand the rules. So just to clarify yeah. for the people that may be in that category, if you do not have prior opportunity and you attempt to get rid of the ball, but you don't dispose of it correctly... It's play on. And mm. for good reason as well. So it happens a lot of the time where someone has a ball, they have no prior opportunity, they get tackled, they go to get rid of it, they, it sort of spills out or they drop it, and everyone thinks that should be holding the ball. They look at it go, that is dropping the ball, it's incorrect disposal. But it's not, and I'll explain why. Uh, because <laughs> as we know, when you have no prior opportunity and you get tackled, it's a ball up. But what we want to encourage is... The ball to be moved on. We don't want repeat stoppages. We want the ball flowing, right? That's so much more exciting than six, seven balls up in the row because someone grabs it, tackled, no prior, mm. ball up. So it wouldn't make sense for it to be no prior opportunity, you're tackled, ball up, no punishment whatsoever. It's not holding the ball. No pu- and then you have an, an incident side by side with it. No prior opportunity, tackle, but you do the right thing and you try to get rid of it because you want the ball to get going. We want to see open play and you don't dispose of it correctly. It doesn't make sense and then, that you then get punished for that, whereas someone yeah. who, who did sort of the wrong thing by just holding it in and tucking it in, the wrong thing by the good of the game, they don't get punished. So we need to reward the players who are trying to keep it moving, trying to keep the ball flowing, so it wouldn't make sense to pin them for holding the ball because if you did, if you did say that no matter what, it's dropping the ball or incorrect disposal, no matter what your prior opportunity is, then no one would ever try to get rid of it. Everyone would just hold it in because then there's no yeah. risk of getting done. And that would be a horrible look for the game. So the rule, the interpretation is right. We just need to get the fans having a better understanding of how it actually works. I think um, the players are really good at... I can't believe how good they are at getting some sort of hand, foot to just get rid of it. Like, go, like back in the days, if you did... A 360, and then eventually we're getting tackled to ground, you'd probably just phone it in and go, uh, I'm caught here. Yeah. But um, Clayton Oliver in particular, he will get a boot to ball midair. Like, he'll be getting rolled backwards on his head. He'll fling his foot at it. He'll get a handball somehow. So it is crazy to see how the players get rid of it um, in that certain situation. Well, I also think the holding the ball. So, yeah, it can be a bit nuffy-ish when people get really worked up about holding the ball and you're sort of watching and you go, well, that's absolutely no way holding the ball. Like, they, they've interpreted wrong. But I think the big ball at the footy is almost the footy's equivalent to the, how's that? Yeah. Like, even even if it's, you know, might be slightly going down leg, if you appeal hard enough, you might be able to convince the umpire that it's out. So it's almost like, even though... He really didn't have prior. If we yell loud enough, maybe we might overturn the decision. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Uh, How's that is one of the all-time great cricket traditions, and I would be devastated if we lost ball to footy. And I I love the initial react, no matter the tackle calling ball, but it's the people that genuinely, genuinely believe that they've been hard done by by the umpires when it's their lack of knowledge of the rules. That's what grinds me gears. But I agree 100%. Keep the ball. Keep, keep the hairs at. Not that anyone wanted to banish the hairs at. Uh, just like nobody wants to banish the goals behind out in the falls because it is the anchor of our show. Yeah. Do you want to kick us off? I'll kick us off. Uh, I'll kick us off with an out in the full. Um, spoke about them a little bit, but the Hawks are at my out on the full. Uh, did you know that the only two coaches to have their debut win against Alistair Clarkson is Matty Nix and David Noble in consecutive years. So how's Hawthorne last year dropped the unthinkable game to the Adelaide Crows. The Adelaide Crows, 0-13, uh. thir- and 13, I think they were. It 13. was the worst, worst start to a season ever. Um, and they, the Hawks, like they dropped that game to Adelaide. Fast forward 12 months and they're dropping the unthinkable game to North Melbourne. Uh, in, so in 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 Launceston, in Tasmania, when they were four or five goals up. Yeah. 
So I think it, yeah, it's a bit of an out in the full on the Hawks. A little bit worried about them. I potentially think they might go down before they come up. I'm not sure it's rock bottom yet, but um, yeah. Well, they, they'd want to make sure they get their draft picks right because you know, when you bottom out like that, you don't really get many players that see Hawthorne as, a, you know, see a, an 18th club as a destination club. So you're really relying on the draft picks there. Um, I saw someone float the question today. Uh, I think it might have been Dermy Brereton on SEN saying, uh, should they trade Chad Wingard? You know, he's, pro- he's 27. You know, will he be there for the next flag? Maybe, maybe not. Would- and you could get good value. You could get a couple first rounders. Um, or a first rounder and a second rounder or something like that, yep. you're in a rebuild, would you consider it? So that's the question they have to ask themselves. But the, the draft picks they do have, they'd absolutely want to make sure they nail it. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, with their history, they probably do. So um, the ball's in their courts. Rog, what's your out on the full? My out on the full is quite literally the most, it is the most literal out on the full you'll ever receive because it's poor goal kicking. Um, you know, we obviously saw it's been talked about enough. Uh, the Max King, uh, Friday night, you know, just couldn't stop missing for the Saints. And yeah, you know, poor goal king, it's obvious why it's out in the full for all. Yeah, you know, everyone understands why your, your team works their ass off. It's so hard to get a clean entry inside 50, it's so hard to get a shot on goal, especially when you're playing a good team like Geelong. So when he's, when it's your responsibility, you need to go back. And what frustrates me more about um, – it's not so much the missing because we all miss. You know, it's, we're not – no one's perfect. So you're going to miss f- some of the time. And mm. I'm no goal-kicking expert, as we've seen from your YouTube videos before. <laughs> but it frustrates me when you're watching AFL footballers who are paid so much money. Some of them don't even have a routine. Like you see some players, they – there's nothing consistent about it. They're changing each time. Mm. And then you see some players who walk in and, like, they start walking, you know, at right angles and then they hook it around. It's frustrating that they don't know how to kick set shots, some of them. Um, so yeah. it's easy to uh, sit here, armchair fan, and say, oh, you don't know how to kick a set shot. I'm sure when you're in front of 50,000 fans and everyone watching at home, it's not easy. But... All I want to see is a consistent set shot routine where you line up straight with the goals, Ben Brown style, run straight at the goals and put your slipper through the pigskin, point the toe, get it between the big sticks or there or thereabouts. Um, yeah, unbelievable point. My behind was Max King as well. I, I felt sorry for the kid watching on Friday night. Missed a couple of key chances. There was one in particular, I think it might have been the last quarter, where he was just dead in front, 15 out, and um, he missed. It was it was tough to watch. I think another one of his his, uh, his clangers was running into an open goal, um, well, r- running into the open 50, and he just couldn't pick it up. And you're sitting there going, come on, Maxi, come on, son, pick it up. And he just kept fumbling it. Um, yeah, one of the bigger nightmares performances you'll ever see but I was also disappointed in um, some of the social media um, I was I, as well I was going to yeah. raise that point with you Do we'll just yeah some of the things that I saw people quick to write people off I think there's such a negativity online um, like I wrote you know I hate it I, I write stuff on Twitter and you'll get people who don't follow you just write um, negative stuff and it's I don't know it's quite I don't mind the back and forth with people. I actually quite enjoy getting on Twitter and there's a lot of regulars on there that I love, you know, bouncing ideas off in, in like a constructive way. There's definitely times I've mentioned things before. Um, for instance, like I was talking about, well, this this probably could have been in here, but how Damien Hardwick said he didn't like going to Marvel Stadium. And I sort of got on Twitter and I said, oh, well, you know, in terms of viewing, uh, you know, in terms of... Uh, like top times where I've viewed the game at Marvel, I've been a little bit disappointed. And often if the D's are playing a home game there, I'm not pumped to go and sometimes I might miss it. So I understood that, uh, what Damien Hardwick was saying. And, and you know, there were some blokes getting on going, uh, that's why, <laughs> there was this one bloke in particular, he just wrote, oh, well, that's, that's why Melbourne <laughs> looked at as, you know, one of the softest teams of the competition. <laughs> yeah, no surprises there. And I was just... 
was just that's just the negativity of Twitter. How have we, how have we got here from the Max from Paul Golgi? I thought I wrapped it. I thought I wrapped it well there. That the negativity of yeah, Twitter yeah. and the negativity of like social media. No, um, I do. I, I I was gonna raise that point with you um, because <laughs> it's a it's an interesting one where you're in the world of football. You're getting paid. Great money uh, to kick a ball around. There are so many positives out of being a footballer. Um, but where do you sit on, you know, and I don't want to be someone that's overly politically correct unless, you know, I, want to, I don't want to be living in a world of marshmallows and cuddles and that's it. But uh, it is an interesting one where a player, Max <coughs> King, you know, he's kicked one goal six. He's obviously be disappointed with his performance. He'd lose a lot of sleep over it. You know, there'd yep. be a lot of... Yeah, whether they should or shouldn't be, there'd be a lot of embarrassment, you know, just knowing that the whole footy world was watching on that Friday night. And, mm. you know, do we need to be jumping online, everyone tweeting him, everyone making statuses, um, talking about how shit his goal kicking is, you know? There is a humanitarian aspect to it where you, you do think that, you know, this is just a bloke trying his best out there to kick a footy around and now... Everyone's taking the piss out of him online. I don't know if it's necessary, but at the same time, um, you'll get a lot of people saying, "This, we're, it's football. We're keeping it inside the world of football. We're not saying Max King's a bad person or anything. Yeah, we're just true. Saying, we're just saying he played a bad game and he's a footballer and he's open to that criticism. So there are both sides of the argument. I do understand both. But for, for me, it's not my sort of cup of tea to be on there and start slating a player and... and and tweeting them and whatnot, but jeez, yeah. it, it happens. It's it's rife. Twitter's probably the worst. Instagram, any um, AFL post on Instagram, like I'll just click on any, and the top comment is just so so negative towards what's been posted. Whether it, it, it might be like uh, Connor Rogers kicked six this week, and the top comments, yeah, but he didn't do it last week against a good team, and, and then the second one's just piling on and piling on, piling on. So I, I just. The negativity online, especially in AFL, it's pretty poor. Well, it, it does need to be talked about because obviously we, you know, we, and I don't want to take the, go too far into this, but mm. there is so much conversation now about mental health and whatnot. Yep. And I know myself, and I like to think that I'm a pretty strong-minded, confident sort of individual, but, you know, if I just ban your reserves football, if I played a poor game and I went online and I saw just a bunch of randoms talking about how shit I played and, you know, taking the piss out of me, it, that would have to have an impact on you. And yeah. it, w- it wasn't an issue when, um, you know, back in the day before social media, me and you would go, you know, and two blokes would go to the pub over a Palmer and a pot and they'd go, fuck how shit was Max King's goal kicking on the mm. weekend. Yes. That's, you know, that's between you having a, having a beer talking about the footy. But when you're actually posting it online in a forum where him and his family – can see it and whatnot. I don't know. I think that, um, and feel free, free public to call me a marshmallow and to harden up and whatnot, but I do think that it's a conversation that needs to be taken seriously because these are people that are just trying to do their best. Yeah, for sure. Um, Roger, what's your behind? My behind was, you touched on it before, uh, was the Dimmer Hardwick press conference. Um, yeah. My behind because... It's, the reason why it's a behind and not an out in the full is because I love characters in the game. I love personalities. And above all else, I love honesty. I love people speaking their mind. So I'm not going to come out and say Hardwick shouldn't have said we don't, we hate playing at Marvel or we hate yeah. coming to Marvel because I love that he's speaking his mind. He's given us something to talk about. And, you know, yeah. we've seen the true Damien Hardwick. We're not getting the PR... Uh, filtered Damien Hardwick. Um, yeah. but, but on, you know, the actual content of what he said... Um, you know, harden up. You, you mm. ha- it's like, you hate going to Marvel. Fucking, you, the AFL has a con- whether you like it or not, the AFL has a contract with him. Go there and, you know, it's like he's giving his supporters an out to not come to Marvel. Like, yeah. th- they had the lowest home crowd as- attendance I've had since, I can't, the stat was something like 2009 or something stupid like that. Maybe I'll get yeah. that a bit wrong. Um, and him coming out and saying, well, we hate coming to Marvel. It gives the supporters an excuse not to come. Like, it's almost like a, a protest, nearly. But it shouldn't be the attitude. That's where you're playing. That's where your schedule is. You're in, it's not the end of the world, mate. It's not like you're being asked to play on the back oval down at bloody Watsonia High School. Yeah. You're, you're, you're playing at Eddie Ad sta- uh, at Marvel Stadium, rather. Tell your supporters, you know, we know that we don't play our best footy at this ground and it doesn't have the best atmosphere, but get down, let's pack the stadium, let's make it our own and let's make it a home away from home, so to speak. I think you went in with the wrong attitude. 
I think um, he was. I think he just went on the defence of people criticising the crowd, but. Um, because Melbourne are an MCG tenant, when and we get, I think we get one a year at Marvel, one home game, or, or it's something like that. But uh, whenever I've gone or not gone <laughs> to home games at Marvel, there's a clear drop off in crowd size, and I would suggest if there was a stat, there would be a drop off in the average crowd of an MCG tenant when they go to Marvel. Like, I'm pretty sure Collingwood had a home game against Brisbane, and this might have been COVID-affected as well, and it did get changed within a week. But that was on a Thursday night, and I, I don't believe that got a big crowd, and that was an MCG tenant at Marvel. When the Ds play there, we don't get a big crowd, and it's really below. It's like, it's your 18,000s. Um, so I wasn't surprised that the Tigers fans didn't turn up there. Um, yeah, I see some. It, it wasn't just didn't turn up. It was their lowest attendance in since 2009 and years. And it wasn't like they were playing uh, the Gold Coast, you know. They were playing GWS, who are a genuine <laughs> top eight contender. Like, this is this yeah. is like a great game of football. This isn't this isn't against North Melbourne. This is, you know, Tigers, they've got a undermanned lineup. You know, they need the support now. Um, I would have expected... Expected a bit more there for for such a big matchup. Yeah, no, nah, for sure. Um, we'll go into the goals, so I don't harp on about Marvel <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Um, my goals this week is Cody Waitman. Oh, uh, one lovely. of my one of my favourites. One of my favourites. I, I loved him at the draft because there was a lot of talk for the D's whether we go Cody Waitman or Kasaya Pickett, um, and. I was excited about the Daisy Thomas type presence that Cody Waitman had with the hair. He takes hangers, he kicks goals, and he's just like if you've seen an interview with him, he's the most bubbliest kid uh, you'll ever see in your life. So I'm a massive Cody Waitman fan. Some of the I think I think his first goal up at the Gold Coast uh, last year was just from the pocket, and he just slots a, a, a pretty you know a, a pretty average banana for for his standards as his first goal. He was kicking him over his head. At Adelaide Oval, um, he's one of my favourites, and um, yeah, his three goal performance was was special. Yep, absolutely, that's a great goal. I love seeing uh, a young player come in, especially to a good team, and um, repay the faith shown in them. He had to bide his time a bit in the twos, but uh, played good footy, come in, done his role, and um, he has a bit of courage about him as well. I like him as a player. Yeah. Uh, my goal is the Brisbane Lions and Jared Lions. Um, they were had question marks over them at the start of the season. Like people thought they weren't quite tracking exactly how they would have liked to have been. Mm. But they've come good emphatically. They're in the top four now, and I don't think wow. they'll be going out of there anytime soon. And um, you know, just a bloke who just keeps on going about his business is Jared Lyons, who you know has been. Talked about so much before how uh, Gold Coast gave him up for nothing, and um, <laughs> yeah. you know there are question marks around why that happened. But uh, he's just keep keeps on keeping on and playing absolutely unbelievable football. Leading the coaches' boats, I believe. Is he? I believe he is. Or oh, maybe that's big luggage. Maybe I've got my lines mixed up. Yeah, I, I reckon, think I reckon it is Hugh. I reckon it is uh, McLuggage. I think he's moved. Oh, I saw something. I saw something about lines moving in. To um to like the Brownlow favourites, I, I saw something where he was like pushing up as um yeah as one of the favourites for something. But he he's been very consistent. And just to touch on the Lions, yeah, I, I was downing them a little bit. They were in all sorts. They dropped that game to Geelong. They had a game down against the Doggies at Ballarat, and they just couldn't get it going. And it it looked like one of those seasons where they could be chasing their tail a little bit. Four or five weeks later, they're well and truly back within the hunt and a real threat. Like, I know they've knocked off Gold Coast and um, a couple of other sides, but the way in which they're going about it is a bit ominous. And, um, yeah, I, I can't wait to see how they go throughout the season because they're looking like a bit of a force. Well, I cannot wait to see later in the season. The top four as it stands is Melbourne, Bulldogs, Geelong, Brisbane. And then Port Adelaide is losing a bit of losing a bit of trust. Um, you know, they seem to be losing uh, their audits 
uh, as you like to call it, McDonald, whenever they yeah. play against a good side or maybe away, they don't seem to be as productive as they should be. And then you've got Sydney and West Coast who are both playing good footy and, you know, mm. they both have that home ground advantage. And then you have Richmond who are eighth. And when Richmond are eighth, <laughs> uh, you know, like this top four, they'll come, we know they'll come good and just keep on playing good footy. So, yes. Jesus, this top four race is going to be absolutely hot as hell uh, come later in the season. Can't wait to see who finishes up there. But Brisbane are as good a chance as any now. They've earned my respect and trust. Not that I'm sure they care too much about that. Um, but, yeah, th- it's it's going to be a bloody exciting end to the season, McDonald. Yeah, it's so exciting. Yeah, that, that top six bat's very, very deep. And it's like if, if you flip the top six on its head, it, it probably w- would look fine. Like it's it's not like... It's almost like the top four looks like it's out of whack more than, you know, four to eight, really. I think, I think the top eight is set now, though. I don't think, you know, GWS playing great footy, but I don't see a Richmond or West Coast or a Sydney slipping out. So GWS, Frio, St Kilda, Essendon, Carlton, etc. I just can't see a way they sneak in. Exciting, exciting times. Can't wait to see how it all pans out. Rog, but, thanks for joining Wait, but, 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 uh, yes. premiership favourite is the Melbourne Demons. <laughs> and I would like to hear you, like to hear you uh, bring that point home for me. Talk about the Ds. I just wanted you to tell me that they're the premiership favourite. Well, <laughs> I don't know who's putting money on them. It's quite funny. Um, I watched the replay of the Ds Blues game, just to wrap us up quickly. Yeah. And um, Brian Taylor was very, very condescending about the Ds. Sort of like what he was just memeing us. He was going, Oh, I don't quite trust them yet. And but like throughout the whole coverage, just kept saying stuff like that. And because there is an aura of do we trust the D's yet? Are they trustworthy? Do we back I reckon them that's in? gone? I reckon that's gone. I think everyone knows you're the real deal now. Well, I think that's gone too. But Brian kept just really ramming home the point and JB was like oh I don't know what the D's have done to you Ryan but yeah. they're, they're playing great footy um it was quite bizarre but exciting times uh Rog I think that's it for the episode uh, I'll have to get you back in the studio next week oh mate mate have the curry ready for me in a couple games of FIFA as well absolutely it'll be piping hot uh we just want to thank everyone who's tuned in everyone who's watched and we'll see you very very soon for another episode cheers Keep plugging those back pockets.